Hey guys, so this is the second video in our mini series on depression. The first video was on the symptoms that one might experience when having depression. And we also go through the criteria that a clinician might use to diagnose someone with depression. Uh, so if you haven't seen that one, check it out. But this video, I thought we'd go one step deeper and talk about the cause of depression, the etiology. Long story short though, if you just wanna save time, the answer to that question is we don't know. We do not fully understand what causes depression, but in this video, we're gonna go through what we do know about what causes depression. We're gonna discuss some of the key theories around what causes depression but also we're going to discuss some of the important risk factors that increase one's risk of developing this severely disabling disorder. I'm going to use the term depression but in psychiatry uh, and in clinical language we actually call it major depressive disorder and there are other types of depressive illnesses which I talked about in the previous video but uh, this is really about major depressive disorder. But I'll just use the term depression because that's a layman's term that everyone uses. For those of you who are new here, hello, nice to virtually meet you. My name's Sil, I'm a, well I've just finished medicine and I'm starting as a junior doctor in a month and a half in a psychiatry team and I'm really interested in mental health so I'm making all these educational videos around mental health. If you find them helpful or are interested in seeing more, consider subscribing. Okay, let's get into it. Why do some people get depression and others don't? Well, as I said before, we do not fully understand uh, the etiology or why some people get it. There is no blood test out there that you can do that'll tell you with 100% certainty that you have or will develop depression. And this is an unfortunately common predicament in psychiatry. Uh, it's not like other medical specialties like cardiology where you really understand at a cellular level what causes so many of the diseases. So for example, with a heart attack, we know that it's atherosclerosis of one of the vessels in the heart that's constricting the blood flow. And with less blood flow, you have ischemia and then an infarct and a myocardial infarction is what a heart attack is and then the heart dies and that's how it all happens. And we understand it at a cellular level. But with the brain, it's different. The brain is the last biological frontier. It is incredibly complex, way more complicated than a heart. I'm sure that was offensive to some cardiologists out there. I'm sorry, but it is. But even though we don't fully understand the cause of um, many psychiatric diseases like depression, it's worth discussing what we do know about the causes of depression. So the dominating theory in recent history has really been the monoamine hypothesis, which stipulates that and this is simplified, our very important neurotransmitters in regulating mood are decreased in concentration in the brain, especially in important circuits that regulate mood in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And these monoamines are things you might have heard about like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Studies that have looked at like serotonin metabolites have found that there's less serotonin metabolites in the spinal fluid of people with depression. So that means that there's probably less serotonin. We've also kind of had a proof of concept where we, when you give people with uh, depression medications that increases the amount of serotonin, especially in the synaptic clefts between neurons, when neurons speak, increase the amount of serotonin in that cleft, the symptoms of depression um, improve. We've also seen with dopamine uh, diseases that that affect dopaminergic pathways are associated with depression, such as Parkinson's disease, uh, and drugs that reduce dopamine concentration actually are associated with depressive symptoms, such as Serpicil. So that's the monoamine hypothesis. And although that is now currently accepted as a real phenomenon in depression, we, not, we don't fully believe that that's the main cause in depression. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that there's dysfunction in neuroplasticity. Um, of people's brains who suffer from depression. If you wanna have a good understanding of what neuroplasticity is, I suggest you read the book, um, The Brain That Changes Itself, but I think it's by Norman Deutsch. But essentially, neuroplasticity is the ability of different neuronal circuits to change and adapt to compensate in deficiencies in other neural circuits. So if you have one pathway that's becoming deficient and crap, uh, then another pathway can adapt and uh, take over that pathway's role. This is pretty promising because it means that people who have depression, if they have neuroplasticity uh, dysfunction with neuroplasticity exercises, um, that could be an adjunct to therapy. Look, since we don't fully understand the cause of depression, it's really important that we have a good understanding of the risk factors of depression. And in psychiatry and in mental health, we always consider risk factors in terms of the biopsychosocial model. Some argue that it should be called the socio-psycho-bio model because of how important social factors are and how often 
us medical professionals forget to consider them. Uh, but anyway, biopsychosocial is the current term that's being used, so that's what we'll use. And in terms of the biological risk factors, we know that you know there's genetics and even probably epigenetic uh, influences for depression. Uh, if you have a first degree relative, like a brother or a sister or a parent that has depression, you are four to six times more likely to develop depression. Other biological risk factors are chronic inflammatory states. So if you have some autoimmune disease that's causing chronic inflammation, um, there's actually this new theory around depression, how there's actually immunological changes in the brain and that's been associated with an increased risk of depression and it's actually breeding this new field of kind of immunopsychiatry. Also, if you have any chronic diseases, really you have an increased risk of depression. It's probably related to the other psychosocial stresses that chronic disease states can bring. Uh, and finally, age, the older you get, um, the more likely you are to develop depression. In terms of the psychological risk factors, uh, personality temperaments are a big one. So people who have neurotic personalities or irritable personalities are at increased risk of developing depression. Also adverse childhood experiences or neglect are related to increased risk of developing depression. So in terms of social risk factors, we know that people born into poverty or low socioeconomic areas are at an increased risk of developing depression. And of course, loss of important relationships and bereavement and grief can become depression. Grief is not depression, don't get me wrong. It is a normal, healthy, healthy-ish state. But if it goes unresolved, it can develop into a major depressive episode. So guys, I hope what you're realizing here is all of these things increase your risk of developing depression, but do not guarantee that you will develop depression, which means we don't really know what causes it, as I've said. Also, a lot of these risk factors are correlational in nature. That's unfortunately common in psychiatry. It's very hard to prove causation because we can't, you know, directly do tests on the brain. Uh, but anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful and informative. If you did, consider leaving it a like. That really helps me out. And other than that, have an absolutely lovely day. Bye for now.